It's so good to see everyone in person. You know, one thing about when you speak to a camera, it's just not the same, but it's really good to be here, and I just missed all of you so much, so thank the Lord. It's a wonderful thing to just be back home with our Bethel family, um, and also to be here with you in person and not in quarantine. Um, I just wanted to call attention to something that uh, Pastor Lisa had mentioned, and that is that tonight... Um, we are sharing a link with the ordination service from the New Jersey Ministry Network. Understand, this year has been very unusual. And normally, ordination takes place at our network summit uh, in, in, during the, uh, in May. However, this year, the, uh, the pandemic really complicated matters. And so, because our elders wanted to have a service in person, they just kept extending the deadline until uh, we got to the point where we said, well, we'll just have to have a limited service and then um, stream the service so that this way others you know, can watch. Um, so, and which, in a way, is, is a good thing so that this way uh, so many more people can actually participate. For me, it's a very proud moment because I've learned, I've, uh, as a presbyter, I have laid hands on a good many people to ordain them to the ministry, but I'm very humbled and grateful to be able to lay hands on my wife tonight. Um, and ordination is, I guess you would say for us, it is the, our fellowship, the New Jersey Ministry Network, recognizing what we have known and observed all along, that Lisa Pastore is called by God, she is anointed by God, she is used by God. And so it just thrills me to be able to not only share that experience with her, but to share it with all of you as well. So please join us for that. I was ordained 20 years ago, and I can tell you it was one of the most profoundly special days in my life. And so I hope and pray that it's that for you as well, even though the circumstances are a little different this year. Anyhow, I'd like to ask you to open the Bible. We're going to turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, I'd like to read the text in its entirety because the ideas, it's important that we see the stream of thought that connects these ideas because this is profound transformational truth. What I'm reading is life-changing. And if you are in Christ, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So I'm going to be reading Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. The Word of God says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses, and sins in which, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who, is, who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace. You have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in, the, in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we 
are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The title of today's message is Alive in Christ. Let's take a moment to pray, shall we? Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus, and we thank you for this word. And Lord, we are so, Lord, we're, we're just deeply grateful that you not only speak to us, but Lord, you reveal to us things that are too wonderful us for us to truly grasp with our own minds. And that's why I'm asking for the Holy Spirit. Lord, I just don't have words lofty enough to communicate how marvelous and powerful this truth is. That's why it's got to be the Holy Spirit that talks this morning, even through this flawed vessel. Bless this word, and may we receive it with joy and gratitude. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, Charles Stanley shares this very interesting story about when he was in seminary. He writes, one of my more memorable seminary professors had a practical way of illustrating to his students the concept of grace. At the end of his evangelism course, he would distribute the exam with the caution to read it all the way through before beginning to answer it. This caution was written on the exam as well. As we read the test, it became unquestionably clear to each of us that we had not studied nearly enough. The further we read, the worse it became. About halfway through, you could hear audible groans throughout the lecture hall. On the last page, however, was a note that read, you have a choice. You can either complete this exam as given or sign your name at the bottom and in so doing, receive an A for this assignment. I like to know where he gets these professors. <laughs> we're amazed. I mean, wow, we were sitting there just totally and completely stunned. Was he serious? Was it just as easy? Was it just that simple? Sign your name at the bottom and receive an A? Slowly, the point dawned on us, and one by one, we turned in our tests and silently filed out the room. When I talked with the professor about it afterwards, he shared some of the reactions that he has received through the years. Some students began to take the test without reading it all the way through, and they would sweat it out for the entire two hours of the class time before reaching the last page. See what happens when you don't read the directions first? Others read the first two pages, became angry, turned the test in blank, and stormed out of the room without signing. They never realized what was freely available. And as a result, they totally lost out. One fellow however, read the entire test, including the note at the end, but decided to take the exam anyway. He did not want any gifts. He wanted to earn his grade, and he did. He made a C plus. But he could have had an A. You know, as Stanley recalls, this story illustrates many people's reaction to God's solution for humanity's sins. Some people look at God's standard, moral and ethical perfection, and they throw up their hands and surrender. Why even try? Tell themselves, I could just never live up to all that stuff. Others are like that student who read the test all the way through 
and was aware of the professor's offer, but he took the test anyway. Unwilling to simply receive God's gift of forgiveness, they set about to rack up enough points with God to earn it. By God, I'm going to earn this thing. But God's grace truly is like the professor's offer. It may seem unbelievable, but if we accept it, then, like those stunned, surprised students who accepted the professor's offer, we too discover that, yes, God's grace is truly free. All we have to do is receive it. And that is transformational truth. And, you know, I know that we may be able to intellectually grasp it, but when you think about that, that, that's just truly amazing. Not only that eternal life can be that uh, readily available to us, but because of the greatness of God's heart that provided it. And that's why we need the Holy Spirit to open up our understanding. If you remember last week's message, Paul's prayer was that God would open the eyes of our understanding, that um, he, he would give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. And the reason I point this out, because, you know, sometimes as we begin a new chapter, we kind, of, uh, we kind of forget what went before and we just kind of are focusing here. But Paul's intent when he wrote this was that we would keep that truth in mind. The truth that he mentioned there. He says that the eyes of your understanding would be opened. That you would know, the, that you would understand the riches of God's glorious inheritance to the saints. And the exceeding greatness of God's power toward us who believe. And when he speaks about the greatness of that power that he makes available, he illustrates it with the very resurrection of Christ himself and how he exalted Jesus to the right hand of God. But the miracle doesn't stop there. And that's what we want to talk about today. Because God reveals the unparalleled greatness of his power and the immeasurable treasures of his grace by raising us up with Christ. Now, you may be thinking, okay, yeah, we have the promise of the resurrection. Oh, no. It means so much more than that. And that's what we want to talk about today, just for a little bit. It is so much more. And then when you reflect on what Paul says, when he talks about the immeasurable greatness, the exceeding greatness of God's power toward us, and you see how it's applied to us here, it's truly amazing. It's so great, we need the Holy Spirit to somehow help us to grasp it. It means that God's power and grace are at work in you in miraculous ways for his divine purposes. And I want to talk to you about the amazing ways that God has acted for our good. I'd like to talk to you about five amazing ways that God has acted for our good. Now, first of all, as we look at this passage, it tells us how he saved us from sin and its deadly effects. I'd like to go back and read verse 1 again. The word says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. The power of God available to us through his Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, does a marvelous work of resurrection in us as well. Okay? We were spiritually dead in our inherent sinfulness. Dead in trespasses and sins. That condition describes how we functioned as corrupt moral beings. And that's why I, like, I, I call attention to what Paul says and the revelation. You see, God raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus was sinless. God raised him to his right hand, a position that he rightly held 
in eternity past. That is great enough. But he also exerted his power because he raised you up too. And you were dead in trespasses and sins. Jesus, one could make the case that Jesus earned it. Jesus deserved to be raised up and he deserved to be exalted to that position. But what about you? What about me? What about humanity? We didn't deserve that. And yet, God demonstrated the greatness of his power through Jesus in raising us up in Christ. That is truly amazing. Dead in trust. You know, just yesterday, I was thinking about my former life. And when I tell you the pit of darkness that God took me out of, it, I just stand amazed. Next month will mark 40 years that I've been in Christ. 40 years as a believer. And to this day, I still am amazed at how God pulled me out of a pit of darkness. But even more than that, that he makes me a member of his household. That amazes me. I certainly didn't deserve that. I wouldn't have chosen me. I knew myself pretty well. And I had news for you, I wouldn't have chosen me. Huffington Post ran a beautiful story about a church in Honolulu called the Blue Water Mission. This small church started a restaurant called Seed, which gives people a second chance at work and at life. The article focused on a woman named Mary Nelson, who started working at Seed the prior year. It was only the second job that this 53-year-old lady had ever had. Her first job? Well, at age 14, Nelson's mother killed herself, and she started working on the streets of New York City as a prostitute. At age 18, she tried to start a new life in Hawaii, but she kept working at her trade. Then, when she was in her early 50s, think of it, started as a teenager and now in her 50s, when she entered her early 50s, some Christians at Blue Water Mission persuaded her to leave the streets and try working at seed. She spent the first six months washing dishes because she wanted to be far away from what she had called the good people. But after a lot of hard work and love from the people at the church, Nelson says, I get to be the person I was never able to be. I get to help people without someone trying to take advantage of me. Nelson noted that what she makes in a month at Seed, she used to make in one night on the streets. She had it all. New cars, jewelry, travel, nice condos. Though it also came at a price. I mean, she got beaten and raped, and she lived through so much horror, it defies the imagination. She says, I never thought that I'd be this person I am now. And that is what Jesus can do, not just for her, but for anyone. And I stand here and testify to you. That's what Jesus did for me. Um, the Bible says dead in trespasses and sins. I was no better. And yet, God in the riches of his grace pulled me out of that. To this day, I, to this day, I still stand amazed. And I hope I will always stand totally in awe of that kind of mercy. Now, if that's not enough, he also delivered us from the dominion of darkness. Okay, listen to me, and may, may the Spirit of God help us to really grasp this. Hear me on this. 
I'm going to read Ephesians 2, verses 2 and 3 again. The word says, the word says, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Now you know who he's talking about. What he is saying, it's not just that you and I were dead in trespasses and sins. There's more to the story. In other words, it gets worse. The Bible says that we walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. In other words, we were under the devil's influence. We were slaves to the devil's schemes in our lives. We were under the dominion of the evil one. Now, let me read further, and I'll talk more about that. Among whom also we also once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. In other words, inherently, we were children who were destined for destruction. And that's what we deserve. I mean, by nature, he says. And we were not motivated by noble, altruistic desires. But we were driven by a depraved nature whose default influence was Satan. And you understand what I mean? That was our default setting. You know how when you buy some electronic advice, a device, it has a default? Well, that was our default. We were under the influence, under the dominion of the evil one, the prince of the power of the air and the instruments that he used to manipulate our sinful behavior. Specifically, I'm talking about the flesh. I'm talking about the world. As human beings, apart from Christ, that's who we are by nature. We are by very nature, without even trying it, I mean, without even trying and without being trained, corrupt sinful beings. And that's who and what we were. And I want to take it even a step further. Because remember, humanity, the Bible said, he calls Satan in this passage the prince of the power of the air. In other words, when Adam and Eve fell, that meant humanity was under his dominion. He had a legal right to them and to their souls. And we, as their heirs, who are children of wrath by nature, that meant he had a legal right to your soul without you having any say-so. And that's what it is to be apart from Christ. It means that you are under the dominion of darkness. And that just goes to show the greatness of of the love of God because he just could not leave us that way. God, God love was, God's love toward us was so great that he looked at us and said, I just can't. i got to do something about that. And I'd like, I'd like to go on further because what God did was raise us up to new life in Christ. This is how God provided a solution for you and me. Reading of verse 4, the word says, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together. Now, notice what he's saying here. That God's grace was so great that he loved us even when we were quite unlovable. Our natural human inclination is, well, you know, there are some people that we like, some people that we love, and that's just natural for us. And people that we find offensive, people that we just don't like, I'm sorry, it just doesn't come easy for us to even want to be around them or talk to them or anything like that. But you see, God 
didn't show his mercy toward us because he liked us. Because we were like a bull. Let me put it that way. He didn't, he didn't necessarily do this because we were, say, fun to be with or anything like that. No. The Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that, no, that, that's something that's divine because, listen, you know that that just doesn't come natural for us. While we were yet sinners. And the Bible says that he loved us and he made a way so that we could be forgiven and raised up. And that's the marvelous thing. Not just forgiven, but raised to new life in Christ. It's one thing to be forgiven, but God also says, I'm going to give you a new life. I'm going to give you an opportunity to be born again. You can become a new creature in Christ. You were under the dominion of darkness. Yes, you were controlled by the desires of the flesh and of the mind, but that does not have to be the way you operate anymore. I can make you brand new, and that's what Jesus does. And that's why the, the Word of God says that he gives us all things that pertain to life and, life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his glory and his excellence whereby he gives, he gives us his great and precious promises. He gives us the word of God. He gives us his Holy Spirit so that by these things, we can become partakers of divine nature. We can become just like him. Amen. Amen. Imagine that. We went from being dead to trespasses and sins. We went to being under the dominion of the darkness to being not only forgiven, but raised up new life in Christ. But wait, there's more. He also exalted us to an elevated spiritual standing. Now we're going to go back to verse 6. The word of God says that God raised us up together. And get this, get this. And made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Oh, we, we got to talk about this. Oh, yeah, we got to talk about this. Hallelujah. Right, amen? Does that not... You hear what I'm trying to say? Not only does he... Not only does he give us new life, but he takes it further. Remember how the Bible tells us that he exalted Jesus to the highest place? Right? I mean, remember that? When he raised Jesus from the dead and he exalted him. Where did he exalt him? He exalted him above all principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world. Spiritual wickedness. That's where he put Jesus. That's where he is. But guess what he does? He invites you and me to be up there with him. Do you realize that in Christ you occupy, an, you occupy a powerful place in the spirit realm? He says you're seated in heavenly places in Christ. I know it may kind of, all right, I know it doesn't totally give you the picture, but um, up here in this, this room up here, Maya and Joseph worked really hard to fix up that room. They put a nice conference table that was donated by her employer with nice conference chairs. And it's kind of, and yeah, new. I mean, you know, before, I mean, yeah, we would meet in there, but, it, you know, it wasn't all that special. But it's kind of like now you walk into that room, it's like all freshly painted. It's all got the con nice, fancy, I mean, funky looking. I mean, funky looking conference table with the nice chairs and everything like that. And it's like, you know, it's like you walk in there and you're kind of like, oh, man, I feel like an executive in here. No, 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 it's like, so, so it's funny because it's, you know, it, it's an upper room for us, so there you are, you're seat, you feel like you're seated in high places. Amen. We want to thank you guys for all your hard work uh, for, for making that happen for us, you know. It makes a big difference, not to mention our office over there and all of what was donated there. But, you know, it's funny because, a lot, you know, you go up there and you walk in and you're like, okay, now. Think about that for a second. That's what it's like to be in Christ. Now, listen to me and get this, because this is so important. Where were you before? Dead and trespasses and sins. 
Where are you in Christ? Seated in heavenly places. Where is Christ? Far above principalities and powers and rulers of darkness. So what does that mean? That you are partnering together with Christ to advance his kingdom. I don't think they're getting this. Do you realize that? In other words, you used to be under the dominion of darkness. Now, darkness is under you. You shall tread upon lion and cobra, the young lion and the serpent, you shall trample underfoot. Jesus said, behold, I give you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing will by any means hurt you. That's what it means to be in Christ. You are his instruments to answer the Lord's prayer. One of the greatest, you've heard me say this before, one of the greatest revival prayers ever prayed. Why? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And how does it get done in earth? It gets done by those who are in Christ Jesus. And most marvelously, he gave these blessings lavishly because of his grace. Word says, verses 7 and 8, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And that is the most amazing thing of all. Ravi Zacharias shares a story about a conversation that he had with a young uh, Muslim Palestinian. He says, we were sitting in a coffee shop in Jerusalem and he spoke in soft tones. He mentioned to me that he had observed a conversation between a leading Muslim sheik and a Christian missionary named Brother Andrew. The sheik had recently ordered the killing of eight Israelis because the Israelis had killed four Palestinians whom they had accused of crimes against the Jewish people. Brother Andrew asked the sheik, who appointed you? judge and jury, and gave you the authority to order such killings. The sheik replied, I am not judge and jury. I am merely an instrument of God's justice. There was a moment of silence, and then brother asked, what place is there then for forgiveness? He replied, Forgiveness is only for those who deserve it. Now, of course, right away we can see the problem with that one. Because there's no one who deserves it. There's none righteous, no, not one. Now, there was a real protracted silence. And then the young Palestinian spoke and said, I thought at once this explains everything and nothing. If forgiveness is merited, then it's not really forgiveness is it and right at that point they both saw two entirely different worldviews but I'll take it a step further that's just one illustration the difference between Christianity and every other religion and philosophy on earth really and there are a lot of them Islam Buddhism, uh, Judaism even, uh, and, and, the, and the list goes on and on and on. Um, various different religions and philosophies. The one thing that separates Christianity from all of them, bar none, is that in every one of these religions and philosophies, you've got to do something to earn your salvation. You've got to do something to earn a right standing. And with Christianity, it's simply by grace through faith. And that's something that you and I should really try to get a handle on. 
Because sometimes, even as Christians, we believe in Christ for salvation, but then we think it's kind of all about um, working, a salvation by works, working for it. In other words, yeah, he gave it to me by grace, but i got to work to keep it. Well, I'm not exactly like that. I think a better way of describing it is, is this. It's not about working for salvation. It's about putting salvation to work. What do I mean by that? The Word of God says that it is not of works, verses 9 and 10. It is not of works. It's not of good deeds. It's not of anything that you could do, no matter how great, no matter how benevolent. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It's not about working for salvation. It's about putting to salvation at work. It's that when we realize, again, and that's why, <coughs> please pardon me, that's why the spiritual revelation is so important, is when we really get a hold of that truth, the, how marvelous that truth is that we have been raised up with Christ seated in heavenly places, then we don't have to worry about earning salvation. But as new creations who are seated in heavenly places, we then show our evidence that we are in Christ by the things that we do. And that's why God raised us up, so that we could be his instruments in filling the great commission. And I, I like as our, our superintendent our superintendent, Brother Don James, he says, until the great commission becomes the great completion. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And that's how we fulfill our calling and purpose in Christ. He created us so that we can glorify him by our lives and actions which he ordained that his followers should demonstrate. Dr. Ronald Meeks, a biblical studies teacher at Blue Mountain Community College in Blue Mountain, Mississippi, writes this. I have not had the opportunity to travel much, but several years ago, my dad won a trip to Italy through his business, and he asked me to go along. A highlight of the trip was visiting Florence, the great city of the Renaissance. One afternoon, out of curiosity, I went to a museum where the, some of the works of Michelangelo were on display. As we viewed the half-finished sculpture of St. Matthew, the tour guide explained that this unfinished work was a prime example of Michelangelo's philosophy of art. He believed that in a stone there was a figure or a statue waiting to be released. The work of the artist was to free the statue from the stone. The statue was so lifelike that I thought any minute St. Matthew just might step right out of that huge stone. As I looked about at the half-finished statue, I could see that the artist had begun to free the statue but had not been able to complete it. Tour guide went on to explain that Michelangelo had numerous works that he had never finished. Now think about that for a moment. I know that we often describe ourselves as a work in progress, exactly. Hey, I'm a work in progress. God is chiseling me out of stone, as it were. And sometimes the blows of the hammer, they hurt. But they are releasing us, in a manner of speaking. They are releasing us from what has us bound. But the sad tragedy is, when you look at this statue of St. Matthew, the job went undone. Jesus made the way for each one of us to be released and to step into the reality of what he has made possible for us in Christ. We're all a work in progress. But let's not leave the job undone. The word of God says, as you have received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him. 
There's a reason he raised us up to seat us in heavenly places, not just so we can be a pack of big shots. It's so that we can partner together with him in the work that he's called us to do. And when you think about that, that's significant. Because you and I who are in Christ today can sit here and marvel at the greatness of God's grace. But what about the other people who didn't read the whole exam? Or what about the people who feel like, you know, I just, I'm just not good enough, or they're just hopelessly bound and feel like there's just no way for them? Well, same way God reached you and reached me, we have a job to do in reaching others. And that's why, I'm going to ask you to stand with me, please. I'd like to, and since this is being watched by people outside of our congregation, I'd like to extend an opportunity to step out of the stone, as it were. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ, he paid a price so that all people can experience that same freedom, that same life. You don't have to be bound by sins. You don't have to be dead in trespasses and sins. You don't have to be under the dominion of darkness. Jesus Christ made a way so that you can step out of what is holding you bound. You can emerge from that stone and be free in him. And it's just as easy as confessing and believing because the word of God says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. It is as simple as confessing and believing. And right now, if we can bow our heads, I'd like to give you opportunity. If you've never made that decision, I'd like to give you the opportunity. You do not have to remain dead in trespasses and sins. You do not have to be bound and under the dominion of darkness. Jesus Christ makes a way for you to step out. He reached out to you. He made it possible. Reach back. And it's just as simple as praying like this. And you pray with me. Dear Father in heaven, I thank you that Jesus died for my sins. And I thank you that he did more. When he rose from the dead and was seated in his position of authority, he made a place for me there. I know I can't go out. I can't go there on my own. Please forgive me my trespasses and my sins and the things that separate me. I thank you for what Jesus did on the cross and I put my faith in that and I put my trust in him. Not in my good works, not in good deeds. I'm not going to try to earn this. I put my trust in Jesus and I receive with gratitude what he has made possible through his death and resurrection. And I thank you that, Lord, you make me a member of your family and that I have a seat at the table with Jesus. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. And I'd like to pray for any who prayed that prayer. Father, I just want to thank you, Lord, for those who have taken that step of faith, who have made their confession of faith, who have believed in what you have done. And I pray, Almighty God, that you would do miracles on their behalf, that you would give them new life in Christ. And Lord, as they have received Christ, so they would walk in newness of life. And that they would emerge in the freedom that you purchased for them so that they may fulfill their divine destiny and that they may too join you in advancing your kingdom. In the name of Jesus, amen. I'd like to pray again though. That prayer was for those who wanted to receive Christ. But for those of you who are in Christ, I hope that as the word was coming forth today that there was just something in your heart that was just celebrating and rejoicing. I just hope in some way God was helping you to have just a little better understanding, a fuller understanding of what he's done for you. And so I want to pray for you. I want to ask for God to bless you and I want to ask God for you 
You've been raised up. You're seated in heavenly place in Christ. God's got a purpose for you. I want to pray for that right now. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I want to pray for your people. I want to pray for your children right now. And I ask gracious heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, that Lord, yes, we're a work in progress. And we are excited about what Jesus is doing in our lives. And Lord, I pray that you would work mightily through them. That, Lord, that you would use them to advance your kingdom for the glory of Almighty God. And that they would see your miraculous hand at work through them. That they may come to know the greatness of what you have provided for us. That they would come to know what it means to be seated with Christ in heavenly places. And so that they would walk in the freedom that you intended so they would never again find themselves in the dominion of darkness. Thank you for them, Lord. I bless them. Wherever they go, I bless them. I thank you, Lord, for where you have called them. Where you have them right now, use them for your glory. And Lord, I also want to pray for the needs that they may have, for those who are sick, for those who need wisdom, for those who are brokenhearted, for the various needs, I ask that you, O oh God, would extend your healing hand and that you would work in their lives for your glory and remind them that you are a present help in the time of trouble. So now, Father, I release them so that they can go forward in newness of life. And as your word says, that they have been ordained so that they should have good works follow them. Use them for your glory, and through them may there be many testimonies of how your kingdom moves forward through their actions. Bless them, protect them. Trust them in your hands in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen.